and you can sort of sit on sit on that mountain of failure and and realize that your success came off of the back of those failures um which is useful for realizing that like human beings natural state is failure and if you keep engaging that state if you learn eventually you'll reach success All right, so hello everyone and welcome to the AI Stories podcast. I'm Neil Lizer, I'm a data scientist at IWOCA, and I will be your host. So today our guest is Kyle Crannon. Kyle first studied electrical engineering and computer science at Berkeley, and after that he had a bunch of internships. He worked at Condati and at NVXL, but in 2019, he ends up joining NVIDIA as an intern. He grows there, does a bunch of deep learning stuff. He works on recommender systems, on time series models, on graph neural networks. And he's actually currently still at NVIDIA. He is a senior deep learning software engineer. So if you enjoyed the episode, subscribe to my YouTube channel and leave a five star review. All right, let's start now. Kyle, hello. Are you ready for an episode of AI Stories? Yeah, Neil, um, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and, and to tell my story. Well, very excited to have you. First of all, just tell me, how did you get into this world of AI, machine learning, deep learning? How, how did you get there? Yeah, so uh, I guess to start at the very beginning, uh, you know, my, as for my background, I grew up in Silicon Valley. Both my parents were electrical engineers, um, and they wanted to be, you know, to go into computer science, obviously. And, and, and I, I wanted to as well. I was good at math. I, I, I knew I liked computers. I grew up playing video games and breaking apart old, old printers to figure out how they worked. Um, and essentially, uh, I started getting internships in high school. I, you know, I was in the lucky position where I could, was able to do that. Um, and my first, I'd say real internship was at a company called Sosta and Sosta was a, uh, cloud testing company in, um, in, in South Bay area. Um, so essentially Mountain View, um, and, uh, what Sosta was, you know, sort of about was they were using um, simulation essentially to figure out how a website would respond to the load of a, you know, of let's say a million people trying to connect to Ticketmaster because Taylor Swift is selling her tickets. Um, and, uh, I thought at the, at the time that I wanted to do, uh, like full stack or, or front end, um, development and I tried it for that summer and. I discovered that it really wasn't for me. It was a bit too, let's say it was just a bit too non-intuitive for me. I it didn't really click mm -hmm. and I, and I, you know, decided I didn't really want to do it, but I did see within the company that there were a bunch of interesting stuff where there was a bunch of interesting stuff going on in data science. So I, um, you know, I, I sort of filed that away mentally and said, Hey, if I get another internship, you know, maybe I should try it in data science. Um, well, I didn't do an internship after that in high school and I you know, went to college at Berkeley. And um, I guess contemporaneous with this, the founder of uh, Sosta, or the founder of Sosta had exited his company, he sold it to Akamai Technologies and um, had uh, wanted to find a new company, but he couldn't really hire anyone he'd previously worked with really, because, you know, he, you know, he's just sold his company and they were all mm -hmm. at the little company. Um, but he could hire interns because, you know, like we were, we hadn't been there for a while. I, I didn't work at Sosta in two years. It, it was, you know, both legally and, and contractually and morally okay to, you know, bring me on. So he brought me and a couple of interns on to build the MVP of, of the product of, of Kandati. And the idea behind Kandati was a, um, sort of a data science workbench for, uh, marketers. It's, it's different now, uh, you know, the product is pivoted, but at, at the time that's what it was. And 
that was sort of when I got my first dose of full on data science. I worked on pipelines and reporting and uh, a couple of like notebooks and, 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 and um, data science projects in Julia, which is the language we, we were choosing to use at the time. Um, and essentially I got bit by the data science bug. I, I loved everything data, data science related in that time, like just being able to visualize data and, and to, you know, get something out of data, um, you know, either, you know, from your analyst perspective by sifting through the data and visualizing it yourself or by using models to extract value from data that sort of just hit me as something that was incredibly poignant and it was key to the company too. So some, something that I wanted to be involved in, in that, in that company. And, um, you know, I ended that summer and, uh, you know, I started taking my online courses because I still had a little bit of time before school. And I t actually took um, Andrew Ng's deep learning AI course. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably one of the staples that a lot of people know of. Um, and I like instantly fell in love with the idea of, of deep learning. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I took that course and, you know, consumed it in like, I think it's, it's supposed to be like a four week course. I consumed it in like a week. Um, you know, I was just basically doing ups, you know, uh, lesson after lesson, after lesson, after lesson. And, um, I got really deep into it and, you know, that was my sophomore year, sophomore year of college. So, um, at Berkeley, the way the classes are structured, you can't really take machine learning classes into, until you finish your prereqs. So There's like a bottom rung of classes, and then you can move to any elective at the top. So, um, I rushed to finish all of my other classes as soon as possible. So I could take ML classes at Berkeley, you know, as quick as possible. So I finished my, you know, my physics, my E classes, I finished my, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, my discrete math and my, you know, computer architecture classes, um, just so I could get to them quicker. And, um, in software year, I also took an ML class at Berkeley. Um, but, sort of in that time frame, uh, I decided I wanted to work on deep learning specifically. And I was, you know, not many companies are going to allow, um, let's say a, a software at, at Berkeley to, to work on deep learning, you know, full, full stop. Um, but I found a startup named NVXL that was working on hardware acceleration for, um, uh, for specifically computer vision. And it was called MB MBXL. Uh, my historical experience was with computer vision, so it was a good match. And they brought me on, and I, I worked on um, uh, basically FPGA compilation for um, common kernels in in, in ResNet uh, 101, and um, among other things. Uh, you know, my, my resume speaks a lot more about mm -hmm. that, but. Um, that summer, I, I, I decided two things. One, I don't like working directly on hardware because when, if you're working on FPGA compilation, that's essentially what you're doing, right? You're, you're putting the logic on the gates in the FPGA in order to, you know, elicit some output. Two, I really like deep learning. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I decided from then on, you know, I, I want to work with deep learning. And that sort of takes me to NVIDIA where, you know, I came to NVIDIA, or I, not I came to NVIDIA, it, I mean, NVIDIA approached me, uh, or a recruiter approached me and said, hey, you know, like, it looks like you're interested in deep learning, would you be interested in working on a deep learning algorithms team? And uh, as they say, the rest is history, right? You know, I, I interviewed, joined the team immediately and, and, and have really just fallen in love with deep learning even more and, and um, you know, working at NVIDIA as well. So you touch on a lot of things here. Let's yeah, I'm sorry. go, let's go. No, no, that's great. Great overview of what you've done. Let's go through them one by one. We've got a few questions first. So just to recap, you worked at Condati. That's where you started getting into data science. Mm -hmm. You then had another internship at NVXL where you did more deep learning stuff. And then you ended up joining NVIDIA. And yep. obviously in the middle all of, of all of this, you got really interested by deep learning and try to take as many deep learning c courses as you could. At yeah, I Berkeley. packed them in. I packed them in. Mm -hmm. So first thing is Condati. That's where you kind of started to get into data science. So first of all, what is the company doing? Like it was related to marketing, but what exactly did they do? And 
you mentioned you loved playing around with data. What kind of data was this? Yeah. What kind of visualization did you make there? I'm yeah, interested so, to um, see. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. Kandati, the thesis of Kandati initially going in is that the tools that marketers have to ingest and utilize their marketing data and visualize it are actually not that good. So Kandati's initial product, which has now since been, you know, it's, it's something else now, um, was called CDWB, which is Kandati Workbench. And the idea is um, marketing data generally is like heterogeneous and very multi-source. So you have your Google ads, you have your Facebook ads, you have your, you know, all of the channels by which you're doing marketing. Mm -hmm. And the data that they return is really heterogeneous, meaning it's not, you know, it's, it's not homogenized or, or, you know, put into a format where they're compatible with each other. So Kanadi, the first thing that they did, and, and this was before I was here, sort of wrote an adapter layer between each of those, um, data sources so that they, they could be, you know, uh, homogenized and enriched so that they'd all fit within the, the scope of a single table. Um, and then the second thing I guess that, that they did on top of this was now that they have all the, all the data in one, you know, enriched data source, the goal is to provide, you know, visualizations and, and indicators for your marketers to determine what's going well, and what's not going well in their marketing. So the type of data that we're working with is like, you know, like we have this ad out for X amount of time. This is the number of engagements. This is how much these ads cost to run. And the goal is to either, you know, do something prescriptive, like, you know, like, oh, you should turn this off. That, that wasn't really in my time there. That, that happened a lot mm -hmm. later. That's more what Kandati's current product looks like. Um, but the original thought was, do you even know, can you even visualize, do you even know like what your, what your ROAS is and you know, what, you know, which campaigns are trailing, which campaigns are doing well, what about these campaigns is going well. So, um, the goal was to bring that or using data to bring that information to the forefront. Okay. It makes sense. So it's a product that they're selling to other companies to better understand their what they're doing, how well they're doing in terms of marketing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you guys don't know, right, like uh, basically, you know, every company on earth now is, is moving their marketing or, or not moving their marketing org is adding a supplemental data org to their marketing org to make their campaigns work better. You know, it, marketing and, and AI at this point go very hand in hand. Yeah. And the challenge, I guess, is that, as you mentioned, you're doing marketing on Facebook, on Google on whatever platform and they don't have the same kind of data, right? No. Um, Google might have some rules, might not have the same name for the rules of each or the columns of each data set than Facebook and it might not have exactly the same data. So you wanted to join everything together. Yeah. And they, they even have completely different indicators, right? Like, like Google may have, you know, some tag that, you know, just exists on, on Google ads or, you know, Facebook may have some ML signal that, you know, like, oh, hey, this ad is performing poorly, but it's uninterpretable. It's just, you know, a float. It's like, oh, this has quality value X. Um, so that's really heterogeneous, right? That's hard to like, you can't, mm -hmm. it's not comparable. Like there's no like meter stick that you can measure both of them on. So you sort of have to figure out a way to get them into the same format. And I, I wasn't really involved with that. I wasn't involved with the data engineering part. I was more involved with the um, modeling and, and building features to actually support, you know, marketing data works. So what kind of modeling exactly? Like how well the company is doing? Mm, more like how well is an individual ad doing, right? Like you want to visualize an ad or visualize a number of ads and say, you know, Hey, drilling down here, 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 and here, you know, like, oh, this group of ads isn't doing well, but this one, one member of this family is doing well. Like, why is that? Like, let's look at the data. Like, oh, may maybe it's, Maybe you're getting a lot of bang for your buck because that ad word you're using is incredibly cheap and you've shown it to 10,000 people and only five have responded, but you know, you're, you're still getting good return on ad spend, which is, you know, uh, uh, like the bottom line metric for, for marketers. Um, yeah, so it's more surfacing stuff like that. Do you build an algorithm to interpret this or is it more some kind of data visualization? Like you play around with part, the data. At, at that point, it was more visualization. Like I wasn't doing any modeling on, on this data. Um, yeah. So cool. yeah, most, mostly, mostly visualization, but compared to, you know, 
compared to what current what existed to you know hybridize those data sources, right? Um, that marking data isn't uh, like just having those visualizations and having that information is super valuable for marketers because they, they, they wouldn't be able to get this insight if they weren't able to drill down and, and, and look into each of these, these ad families. Exactly. You don't always need to build models to yeah. build something useful. Of course. Yeah. And then you became in love with deep learning. You mentioned you took this course. What do you think? Why is it that you liked? deep learning so much compared to, you know, data visualization and maybe more traditional AI? Yeah. So there are a couple of reasons, right? Um, one, I mean, I feel like deep learning sort of enables these, well, it enables a couple of things. It enables you to learn on vast quantities of data, which is, you know, really interesting, right? Like it, it you know, some data just cannot be visualized, right? Like they, there are just too many data points. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've ever tried to plot a scatter plot with built, you know, like hundreds of millions or, or tens of millions of, of examples, but it, it looks, it, at that point it becomes a density plot and even then it becomes very muddy. Um, so sometimes humans just can't, don't have the bandwidth to make a bunch mm -hmm. of decisions, right? Sometimes, a lot of times it has to be an algorithm and, and First of all, like that, that throughput scale where an algorithm can do a lot more than a human in a given amount of time was very interesting to me because it allows you to, you know, if, if the algorithm can mimic a human, you can 10 X, a hundred X human effort, a million X, you know, it's uh, it, it allows you to, you know, really expand the scope of what one human can do. And the other reason was I just re really, for me, stuff that I like intuitively, intuitively clicks, um, and deep learning just clicked. Um, like it made sense. Like, you know, the math behind it made sense. Like, like I, I tend to like math. I like to read math papers and, you know, read the, the math behind, you know, AI algorithms. It's, it's a lot, large part of my job. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, like the idea that I get to work with math and at the same time work with something that like takes that math and, and makes a outsized impact on, you know, whatever problem it's applied to is, is, is a cool concept, right? Especially for a math nerd in, you know, his first year of college. <laughs> so, so you like the fact that you could analyze a lot of data and you like the maths behind it. You found it quite interesting. And so you mm -hmm. thought, yeah, let's dig further into that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, um, a large part of, you know, why I liked it is like, okay, like visualization is moderately immediately intuitive because it's visual. Um, but what I found that I liked about deep learning and, and why I found deep learning intuitive in addition to just liking math is that, um, like architectural decisions in deep learning usually have like specific motivation. Um, and once you have like sort of the basics around deep learning, you under you understand that motivation a lot, or like you can really understand the motiv motivation behind architecture design. Like, you know, let's, let's take a new model, like diffusion models. Um, you know, they've been making a huge splash in generative AI and like, I guess not, not in hind, like in hindsight, it's easy to say this, but like diffusion models at their core are actually like pretty intuitive. Um, the idea is that you model every pixel in the image as, you know, part of some distribution and you iteratively add noise, um, you know, Gaussian noise until you, you know, you're sorry, you use a source image and a source caption and you iteratively add noise, uh, like n n a number of layers of noise. And the job of the model during training is just to remove that noise to get to an image. So, okay. So that, that, that makes sense, right? Like you make an increasingly noisy image and eventually like the model realizes how to take almost all the noise out of image, uh, out of the, out of the result and get an image with, you know, how do we generate stuff out of that? Right? Like how do we, how do we, how do we generate actual images that don't exist? Well, the answer is you just give it pure Gaussian noise and it removes the Gaussian noise to make an image. And you know, that while crazy that it works is moderately intuitive. Um, so, yeah, like 
that that's one example I could, I could give more if, 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 uh, you know, but that, that really appeals to me that there's, there's like, sometimes, you know, when deep learning, you don't know exactly why stuff works, but the intuition behind why stuff works is usually there. Sometimes there's just things like, I, I don't know, there's some unexplained things in deep learning. There, there are actually quite a few, but for the most part, like the design choices behind this make like almost immediate sense to me. Um, and that's, that's what I liked about deep learning. Um, yeah. So just to clarify diffusion models are models, which generate images, right? So for example, you give as input, a prompt or a text yeah, and yeah. the model will generate an image based on this yep. text, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly, yeah, that, that, that's what I mean. So diffusion, which would be generative, uh, you know, text to image or sometimes text plus image to image like ediffy, but yeah, basically. Yeah. And so you like the fact that for every kind of problem, you've got some kind of specific architecture, which mathematically makes sense. Mathematically and just like by human intuition. An another example of this would be like in recommender systems, like handling categorical values, right? A, a categorical value is a value that doesn't, it's not continuous. It doesn't fall on like a number line. So an example would be like categories, like your physical location, like what state you're doing a, you know, what state you're in, for example, that's a categorical or what country you're in. And, um, you know, if you try to feed that into a deep learning model, which, you know, like a fully connected layer, right. Which expect dense values. That's going to be, that's going to be nonsense. That feature is not going to be useful, mm -hmm. but what you eventually realize with that is that you can add expressivity to categoricals by embedding them, right? So you can take a categorical, you can have a, a learnable matrix of, of uh, values where, you know, the columns are essentially IDs and the rows are, or it, it depends on your interpretation, but essentially one of the axes is, axes is the IDs and one of the axes is some dimension that you want to embed that categorical into. And you take the categorical, you plug it into the embedding table and your output is a vector that can be a dense vector that can be used as input to the model. And that makes sense because, you know, fully connected layers, deep learning, like the deep part of deep learning usually focuses on dense, like vectors. Mm -hmm. It doesn't focus on, you know, like a categorical, which is completely different. So, um, yeah, it's just that type of intu intuition that just makes sense and, 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 and like, it just clicks for me. It's hard. It's a bit hard to explain. Doesn't it feel a bit also kind of like magic? I don't know. For me, I don't know. I'm not an expert in deep learning like you. I don't dive as deep into the maths. I know the basics like CNNs, LSTMs, but for example, diffusion models, that's yeah. Um, I haven't digged into that, but doesn't it feel almost like magic a bit? Yeah, it's, Even it's when I train, yeah. I, I always feel like it's magical. It's, it's definitely like, I feel like that was what got me into deep learning initially. It's like, oh, the magic of just pressing train and then seeing that it, you know, mm -hmm. the loss is going down. It's, you know, 98% accuracy of predicting what type of flower it is. That, that is very magical, at, at least at the start. But what kept me really was the logic behind it. Uh, not necessarily the magic of it. Like what, like at some point, at least for me, the magic faded and it was more about intuition and about like just really having an un like a, an intuitive understanding of, of what's going on because I, you know, obviously read a lot and, 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 and I can't claim to have an intuitive understanding about everything. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but, um, mm -hmm. the stuff that does exist in the world of deep learning makes, makes sense to me in, in a way that, you know, some other fields, like, you know, for example, like making UI doesn't make sense to me. So I want to focus on NVIDIA because we're going to talk a bit deeper into deep learning and the things you've built there. You started as an intern and then, well, you kind of grew. You're still at NVIDIA. It's been what, three years now, something like that? Two and a half. Two, three two years, and half. two and a half. So yeah, what was the first project that you worked on? When yeah, you so joined? the first project that I worked on, um, so in computer vision, there's um, a model called Mascar CNN. And Mascar CNN is a heavyweight object detection and bounding model. And essentially, 
if you've ever seen those videos where every person in a frame is outlined and there's a bounding box around them and it predicts that them as a bounding box, that's, I mean, that, that might be YOLO or other models now, but at, in mid 2019, that was largely, you know, Masker CNN was one of the most uh, common models for that task. And essentially um, my task was, you know, given okay, just for a little bit of context, uh, in 2019, TensorFlow 2 was just starting to come out. Uh, like there were nightly builds of it. Um, it was still a little bit buggy. You know, the process for building models in TensorFlow 2 wasn't really sorted out. You know, they just introduced eager mode, a bunch of different stuff. And um, my manager presented me with a bunch of projects and, and there was this project and the, the scope is essentially, we have models in TensorFlow 1. We have Mask RCN in TensorFlow 1. We want to build it in TensorFlow 2 and understand what are the issues along the way that come with building a model in TensorFlow 2. And um, I thought this was gonna be easy. Little did I know this was actually super hard and large scale project um, because TensorFlow 2 was still new and there were a lot of moving parts. Um, yeah, that's, that's the core of the project. Did you manage in the end to rebuild the model with TensorFlow 2? Yeah, so um, I did actually, but there's a funny story about that. Um, we got the original implementation of uh, uh, Mask RCNN from a Google repository and assumed since, you know, it was uh, because we did, we, we had a PyTorch version of Mask RCNN already. We didn't have a uh, TensorFlow version. So we got an original version for Google, Google repository in TensorFlow 1. We assumed it was okay because it was in, in the model zoo. Um, what we realized, well, so throughout the summer, I'm working on this model. Like I'm, I'm getting it, you know, trying to build it to convergence, right? Like achieving convergence at scale is really important um, for my team. I, I actually should clarify about what my team is right after I finish the sentence. But um, so I built, I built the model. I, you know, got it working in TensorFlow 2. That was actually pretty quick. And then we realized that the convergence accuracy is not as high as expected. And that's a problem because we need it to be as high as expected. We don't want to release a model that is, you know, underperforming the literature or underperforming uh, previous versions of it. So, you know, we, we, we do a bunch of study. We look at the model architecture itself. I literally look like layer by layer, making sure that the weights are the same shape. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't find anything. And, and I've, I've been working on the model. And one of the things I suggested near the end was, Hey, um, are we sure that data loading is going correctly? And, um, unfortunately I didn't really have time to pursue this thesis, right? Like we were looking into multi GPU problems. Like, could it be Horvod introducing an issue because Hor Horvod, for those that don't know, is a distributed training framework that was targeted at TensorFlow and it got integrated into TensorFlow too. And there was, we were unsure of how stable that implementation was at the time. Um, turns out it was pretty, pretty good, but, um, uh, our issue eventually we figured out was that somehow the data loader had changed in functionality and the data loader was actually only, uh, basically the, the amount of validation data per epic was shrinking, which made no sense. Uh, like the validation set was just getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller or the effective validation set. Um, and, uh, that resulted in us at the end, having a validation set that only reflected like the last third of the data, which apparently is the, you know, in, in training was the weakest part or not, not the weakest part, but like the, the part of the data set that, um, you know, has the lowest accuracy, um, just by coincidence. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, that, that resulted in, you know, an extra month of effort after I left to diagnose that issue because data loader issues are, are kind of. They're kind of sneaky. I'll put it that way. Yeah. You never, I mean, it's so difficult to, once you have something that works, you know, if there isn't any bugs or any error, uh, yeah. an error message that says that's wrong or that's wrong. You, if everything runs, you don't know where the bug is and it could yeah. just be everywhere. You've got this huge model. Um, so obviously it can just be anywhere. Yeah. Then that's, that's a really hard part about my job, you know, like. There's no like objective, like, oh, like the, the, you know, oh, this isn't working. You know, here's a, here's an error. Like there's no, there's no unit test for deep learning really. I mean, there is kind of, but 
I can explain how you do that, but it, it, there's no like real unit test where it's like, oh yeah, like input to output, this is correct. Um, yeah. How, how do you debug your models then? What's your, or your work, what's your approach? Because you mentioned that's part of your job. Yeah, like, what yeah. Are the things well, actually, you do? Let, let's jump back a second and clarify what I do at NVIDIA, just so, ever, you know, for, for the benefit of the audience. Uh, uh, so I, I work at NVIDIA, you know, as mentioned, and uh, I work on the deep learning algorithms team. And our charter is the research, implementation, and optimization of state-of-the-art production-ready deep, deep learning models, which basically means we take academic models that we see in literature or see published online, and we work with them on GPU to make them as fast as possible, as accurate as possible, and um, generally as ready to, you know, for you to pick up and use as possible. We have an externally facing repo called NVIDIA Deep Learning Examples uh, that you can go check out any model, including my implementation of Masker CNN. Um, uh, but the idea is that, uh, okay, so, so that, that's the idea of our team. And uh, yeah, so sometimes we, this involves debugging models. Uh, so how do you debug a model? So, and, sorry, just, just, just to make it clear before we go into debugging models. So you're taking models from the literature and you're re-implementing them, making them more efficient and then, well, releasing them in the wild so that other people can use those models in their day-to-day -day or yeah, for yeah. So their own it, work. It, it, in a sense, it's, it's like a little bit academic, right? Like we're, we're not really selling a product. Our team is not selling mm -hmm. a product, but we provide value by, by, um, well, there are two methods by which we provide value to the company. It's one, you know, we get to prove that deep learning is best on GPU, which is great. Um, and the second thing is that we, you know, sort of having this zoo of models and having, you know, engineers constantly working on these models, like in-house allows us to sort of determine what is going to be important in, in future hardware or software, or the, basically the stack below us in order to accelerate those models. So, you know, like, um, uh, the new generation of uh, uh, NVIDIA cards for enterprise Hopper um, has something called a transformer engine in it. And um, that is informed by, you know, like, oh, we have a bunch of transformer models. How can we like, how can we improve the math that goes on on GPU in order to accelerate those models up, you know, at, at, at the, at the, you know, framework user level. So some kind of indirect it adds indirectly, it adds value to your company. You're not directly making money from those models, but your plan is first of all, to sell more GPUs, I guess, because um, it will be easier uh, to train useful models on GPUs. And two, it's also to, for the long term, your company will know what future projects they have to work on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... The best way to put it is NVIDIA is a full stack company, right? Like we do literally everything in the stack. We build the base hardware, we build the compilers, we build the kernels, we build the, um, you know, the, the operating system that this hardware runs, not really the operating system, but you know, like we, we build the, 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 the base languages that, that these systems run on. And then we build upwards, we build libraries like uh, NVIDIA Rapids, which is an, a GPU accelerated data science library. We build, you know, we build on top of PyTorch and we accelerate PyTorch and we accelerate TensorFlow and we accelerate a bunch of stuff. And then we get to the top level and, and that's where we are, right? We're sitting there and we're saying, first of all, like how, you know, where where could we do better? Like this helps us determine where where can we do, do better throughout the, the full stack that NVIDIA has. And, um, you know, also, you know, which models, which architectures are going to be important. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. I, yeah, I wouldn't imagine, I wasn't aware of this kind of, well, problem solving approach, but yeah, that's actually quite great. And it's also super useful for everybody because research paper are so difficult to re-implement or to directly use. So you're doing some kind of applied research, right? Like. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a, a way to put it. Yeah, so we're we're doing like performance and mostly performance research on on these uh, these models. So the, the models that we release are generally very optimized versus their original implementations. Uh, you know, one of my co coworkers um, just released a or just released a model that I believe was like twenty x more 
quick than the original implementation of it. That was really, uh, there's, a, there's a Google model TFT. Uh, it's a time series model that I, I worked on, um, but he's you know, taking the lead on it. And um, mm -hmm. he, uh, you know, he accelerated it like 20 X based off of the original implementation on GPU. Um, so there was a lot of headroom there, right? Like you can make it a lot faster and um, you know, in doing so, we you we make it even better on GPU. Perfect GPU utilization, one hundred percent. You know, you're you're getting the full value out of out of your GPU. So let's go on to debugging now. How do you debug those models? Let's say you've got something that works. How do you make sure? Yeah, you've got something that works that runs, but you have a bug within your model. How how do you debug that? How do you make sure that? everything works as expected. Yeah. So this is something that I do now after my experience with Masker CNN, but I generally just go front to back. I start at the base. I like I, you, you essentially want to start with, I, I assume nothing about the entire model pipeline is correct. The, the, the training loop's not correct. I assume, you know, like, you know, like the data loader's not correct. Let's go through each of them and progressively build a foundation of, of verified correctness. So that if, if, you know, for example, Let's say, let's say that the data loader is not correct. We can identify, oh, the data loader is not outputting batches that are, um, you know, well formed and, uh, we need to take a look at that or, you know, and, but if we can verify, oh yeah, like the batches are all coming out as expected, it's the right number of batches, you know, it's, it's the right, um, like we've looked at the batch content and it, it, it seems correct. Or in some cases you can prove verifiably that the, the batch output is correct. Okay. So you've done that, right? Once the data load is done, you can just move on to the training loop and you could say, Hey, like, let's, let's look at everything here. Let's say, you know, like, are we zeroing the gradients? Are we, um, you know, making sure that, uh, you, you know, like if we're quantizing, like using automatic mixed precision, which is, um, for, for those that don't know, uh, uh, basically doing a lot of the computations in, in floating point 16 instead of floating point 32, uh, which accelerates the model significantly. Um, because it's uh, lower, lower precision and, and there's, there's greater, um, you know, effective like float bandwidth because your, your floats are now half the size. Um, you know, you look through all that, that portion of the training loop. And then once you're, once you've verifiably proven that the training loop's working, then you look into the model architecture, model architecture, you know, if you're building off of a reference can be easy. Uh, like if you have a model side by side, like, let's say I was moving to from TensorFlow one to TensorFlow two, um, what you can do then is you can just run the entire, you can run one batch that, you know, in TensorFlow one, um, take the activations and take the weights in, in that model, um, you know, pull them out, like put them in a file, uh, take the same initialization, move it to TensorFlow two in your model, do the, do the exact same batch. You pickle the batch and you just feed it to the other model. And then you compare layer wise, the, the activations and the outputs. And, you know, if those are the same, you know, Kara, you've effectively mimicked the model. Um, and then, you know, if that works and it's still not working, you, you have to ask yourself like, Hey, like I need to look at the evolution of the loss curves. Like, is there something I'm doing wrong with respect to like optimization? Like, are we using a different optimizer diff using different optim optimization parameters? And then like, sometimes at the end, right. You're, you're looking at something and you're like, oh, like. Like, okay, maybe I, maybe I still have lower accuracy, right? What do I, what do I, what do I do then? Even, even then you can just check to make sure like, uh, you know, like, oh, am I using the right metric? Like, oh, TensorFlow one uses a, AUCPR, but you know, for some reason I'm using precision as my, as my metric, uh, you check your metrics, you check, uh, that the test set is, is the same across your, you know, different versions. And, and that's sort of generally how you debug it's, it's, it's a series of the component before me works. So now I move on to the next component and we check this component. And once this works, we move on to the next, 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 next. And that way you sort of build up a knowledge base of, of this works a hundred percent, or I'm very, I'm very confident that this works. And thus it ha the problem has to exist later. Um, okay. So start, start at the top, make sure that what's going on at the top, at the beginning of your pipeline works, get some kind of okay, I know that's not the issue and then move on. And little by little you eliminate part of the pipeline where, well, basically 
you eliminate part of the pipeline because you know that there isn't any bugs there. Yeah, yeah. This the, there was actually a piece of advice I was given by my manager uh, when I was an intern, and he said, um, "Deep learning and working on projects like this is a very scientific process. Essentially, what you're doing when you're when you're trying to debug a model is you're presenting a hypothesis that some component is broken, and your goal is to figure out if that hypothesis is true or not." Um, so you go in and you iteratively, you know, you have your hypothesis moving in a sliding window. So you have like, oh, the hype, you know, like data loader's broken, or you know, like, oh, the model's broken, or oh, the optimizer loop is broken, and um, that's generally how you go through with debugging a deep learning model. I would say that's the case, not even just for deep learning models, for any problem that, yeah, yeah, the, yeah. It's um, a scientific method. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. I think deep learning might be an extreme case because it's something quite complex and quite big, right? You're dealing with something quite, comp yeah, quite huge, like lots of layers, lots of weight. So you really need, if you don't have this rigorous pro process of checking things one by one, you might never find the bug, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. You need to be rigorous and, and pace yourself because it's, you know, you have to, you're gonna have to get through everything. And if you miss something, if you make an assumption that something's working when it's not, that can lead to issues. So I wanna now move to talking about graph neural networks. You're kind of the owner of graph neural networks at NVIDIA. You worked also on recommender system and time series models, but let's focus on graph neural nets what exactly are graph neural nets? What are you doing at the moment? Yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I I work on a team that works on on graph neural networks. And what are graph neural networks? Well, first, like let's let's lay out some taxonomy here. Uh, the first thing we need we need to talk about is well, like what is a graph? A graph can be essentially considered as a set of nodes representing entities and edges representing relationships between those entities. Um, so, and that, and, and that edge, you know, node edge, you know, relationship can extend to a lot of things. It can be, uh, you know, molecules, right. You can represent molecules as bonds between atoms. Uh, you can represent transaction networks as transactions between people. You can represent road networks as, uh, road connections between intersections. Um, so that's what a graph is. I'm going to continue with my taxonomy, in a, uh, you know right now. So, okay. So what is a graph? That's what a graph is. What is a heterograph? A heterograph is a type of graph that, uh, in which there are either multiple types of connections or multiple types of entities or both. Um, uh, so let's talk about what graph neural networks do. So a graph neural network at its core takes some graph of interest and encodes it. So it's, it's essentially an encoder framework. Uh, you know, like what, well, like, you know, in language and encoder decoder framework, it's an encoder for graphs. So we take the graph, we, uh, essentially, uh, do a series of aggregations and combinations of the data between every node's neighbors. So let's, I'm going to just draw with my hands here. Let's say we have a node right here and it's connected to like one, two, three, four neighbors. Um, when we do a layer of graph convolution, essentially what we're doing is we are taking the information that is, that is, you know, we're taking the information that is in each of those neighbors. We're creating a message from it. We're passing that message, you know, as a, essentially a vector to the, you know, central node, the, the one that is, is key around that neighborhood. And we aggregate that information via, you know, like a mean or a, sum or a average or, or not <laughs> I already said mean, but, uh, or like a max or min. <laughs> um, and you can use that representation either. Well, you can use that representation representation, you know, again, like when you're doing the next layer, right? So like, let's, let's say you've applied that, let that collect and aggregate, you know, uh, uh, operation to all of all the nodes within your graph, you can apply that on top of that. You can use the, the features that you've already generated on each of these nodes and, um, or you can use the, the state that you've generated on all the nodes in order to make a next state. So like, let's say you do two layers of that, then 
uh, let's say we have a, a, uh, an extra node over here that is connected to the, the, cent the central node in our last example, um, that node is going to get the state that was calculated in the previous step um, mm -hmm. uh, from you know the message passed by our original central node. Um, and that's a very basic description of message passing there, you know, there are many, uh, if, uh, if you were to ask how to, more about it, I would encourage you to watch videos on it because visual aid is very helpful in this case. And unfortunately I don't have a whiteboard next to me. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, the essential idea is you were taking a node's local neighbors and you are aggregating the information from them and you're repeating that process across the entire graph. First of all, every layer of GNN graph convolution, you do that across the entire graph. But you add an extra layer on top of that, where once you've calculated the state of all the nodes within the graph, you use those states as the input for the next layer, where you propagate messages based on those states again, and, and again, and again, and again, however many layers you have, um, until you have all the states of all the you know, elements in the, in the graph. And then you can use a decoder on top of this encoder framework for any node in the graph in order to predict some meaningful attribute about the nodes or edges in the graph. So you lay, laid out the theoretical framework. Can you give like a very simple toy example of like a problem that you would solve using a graph network? Yeah, let's 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 uh, let's go through your toy example. Um, okay, let's say that we're a bank and we're trying to look at transactions. So in a tra transaction network, you and me may have some set of interactions, right? Like I might have paid you, or you might have paid me, or um, something like that. And, um, you also may have interactions with other people that are like, you have a linked bank account or something. So those are two different types of relationships. So I mentioned a header graph. If, if we're talking about that, that sort of trend, you know, that sort of multiple types of relationships, like linked bank, at, link, linked bank account versus transaction. That's that indicates a header graph in this system, right? Uh, let's say that we want to predict, um, whether or not a transaction between two people is fraudulent. What we do is we take our graph convolution, we apply that to our entire subgraph of interest. Like, l l like let's say we're doing three layers of, of, of graph convolution. Mm -hmm. We take the you know initial layer. You know, we uh, that that basically means. Sorry, just to clarify what that means, we're taking three neighbors away from me and you, right? Like, so you, we're two sides of the same transaction edge. We take three light, three jumps away from either of us and we aggregate the information inwards. And when we get to us and we have our final states, like, you know, multiple steps into the, in, into this, um, algorithm, um, essentially what we want to do now is we want to take these states and we want to apply a multi-layer perception on top of them to determine whether or not our, you know, transaction is fraudulent. And it doesn't have to be an MLP. It can be other stuff. You can just take the dot product mm -hmm. of those two vectors. Um, but essentially that, that, that's a, that's a good example, right? It's our, our, our transaction network. We're looking at three tops away and we're using our local context to determine like, Hmm, are these guys likely to have a transaction between them? So are you adding additional information compared to like, like my question is why wouldn't you use, you know, a traditional approach, like a logistic regression or something yeah, like that? Yeah, why would uh, so accuracy is really important in fraud. Um, you both want to have low levels of false, false positives and false negatives for, for different reasons, uh, right? You, you don't want, you don't want fraud to be fraud to be flying under the radar, but you also don't want a system that's really aggressive and locking people out of their accounts for going to shop at a new grocery store. Um, <laughs> so, uh, essentially what we, you know, why we don't use logistic regression is logistic regression only works on a bounded scope, right? Like it needs to have a fixed width input vector and the encoder portion of a, of a graph neural network. First of all, it can, it can transfer an entire graph into a fixed length of input vector, but that's not really the point of what I'm saying. The reason we don't use logistic regression is it doesn't consider context. Right, it doesn't consider exhaustive local context. So, for example, um, maybe you have five connections and I have two. Right? If we wanted to, you know, for example, do if we wanted to feed all that into a logistic regression model, we need to basically um, 
we need to basically like f feed into a model of only people that have five and two connections <laughs> um, because the, the input width is, is not fixed. So graph neural networks allow you to take like very unstructured, very expansive data and transform it into valuable insight. So it, do you think it's outperforming, like given it has a lot of data, enough data, it would probably outperform a classical model? Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, I, it, and not only that, not only, um, outperform is maybe not the right word, um, because these models can exist in parallel. So for example, there's a Twitter paper called Twin, and they use a graph model to embed their entire follower network. Every follower, every, um, you know, like every tweet they're liking is embedded as a fixed length vector. So, so basically the model, you use the model encoder, which is something that transforms input into a fixed size output, you use the encoder on the entire Twitter graph. And now every node is represented as a vector, right? And that, you know, like, let's say you want to use an actually boost model to predict how likely it is that I should follow someone. Mm -hmm. When that happens at, you know, at call time, essentially what happens is you take the, um, uh, you take the entities involved, right? You say this user and this user, you take the representations that your graph neural network has generated, and you can feed that to a logistic regression model because now each user is represented as a fixed link vector. And, you know, you can use those representations in order to use with a downstream model. So it's, it, it's not like it end to end, these models are competing with, you know, logistic regression or, or other forms of machine learning. Mm -hmm. It's actually used in conjunction with other forms of machine learning because the representations that graph neural networks can, can generate are fixed size. So they can be ingested by most of the models out there, right? Like it's, it's a, it's a useful tool for taking very unstructured, very unbounded scope data and putting it in a package that other models can understand. I feel like, yeah, thanks for this. That's super clear. Um, it makes, yeah, I think this is quite easy to understand. One thing that I, I kind of realize it's been, it's becoming popular, but only quite recently. Do you know why that's the case that we start, we start talking quite a lot about graph neural network. They weren't as popular, like five years ago. Yeah. So uh, I think the first, I mean, graph neural networks, I believe were proposed a while ago. Um, but, uh, as, as is the case with, uh, most neural networks, they are only as good as their hardware and software support. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, there are two reasons we're seeing them a lot recently. Uh, first of all, uh, frameworks like PyTorch geometric and deep graph library, which are the two main frameworks to build, uh, graph neural networks have taken off. Like they're actually reach reaching like a nice maturity. Like DGL is going to be in its 1.0 version in January, which is very exciting. And PyTorch geometric has, you know, has had a number of big releases and, and, and has support for problems that actually matter at scales that matter. Right. Um, and the other reason that we're seeing them more is we're seeing some really big wins. Like, uh, for example, there's a model SE three transformer. You can check it out on our NVIDIA deep learning examples, uh, GitHub repository. Um, SE three transformer is very effective at predicting, uh, based on the computation or the, the model or sorry, the molecular graph of, uh, a, a, you know, a given molecule. Uh, the properties of that molecule. So like the cytotoxicity or, you know, stability or other attributes that you, you know, attributes of interest. Uh, so we've already had some really big wins in graph neural networks and we're increasingly realizing that graph structured data is very expressive. Um, so like there's, you know, people are basically realizing like, well, structuring your data as a graph is a great way to store moderately unstructured data in, in, in for the form of transactions. And graphs are very expressive on this data type, which is why they're, you know, growing in popularity because we're realizing that, that, that this data, this type of data structuring is, is useful. And also, uh, the models on top of it are achieving good accuracy and, and are and achieving positive results. Like the twin paper I mentioned earlier, um, Twitter proved that when it was applied, um, when the, just, just using the representation generated the model, the model's not used online at all. It's not used at inference time at all. Using just the embeddings that are generated by it. Uh, it provides like significant uplift to all the downstream models it's fed to moderately universally, like their ranking models, their, 
uh, candidate generation models, like all these different types of models that they're applying that are core to their business metrics are being improved by just using graph embeddings. So social network is also a big area where- Oh yeah, yeah. So, so or... to clarify what the really big applications right now that, that lo you know, it looks like are, um, social networks are obviously like social, rec social networks and recommendation are, are really big. Um, fraud detection is also really big because uh, fraud has a couple of interesting problems that makes it more amicable to representation learning. And uh, computational drug discoveries is another huge one. Um, and then there are a couple of other tasks that are also of interest, like um, uh, entity resolution, basically taking uh, like, uh, like, let's say like, like a networking network, like, like, like uh, you on your Wi-Fi or in, within your company's network, figuring out based on your activity, who you are is, is another application of graph neural networks that's, that's gaining in popularity. What are you personally working on? Then you gave a bunch of examples. What are you doing at NVIDIA? Yeah. So, um, I'm in the enviable position of working on a lot of these at the same time. So we've worked on models that work on recommendation. We've worked on models that work on, um, um, fraud. We've worked on models and workflows that, that work on entity resolution and, and computational drug discovery. But there's this core realization that my team made a while ago, which is, um, generally building and scaling. Uh, graph models requires a lot of domain specific knowledge. And uh, a lot of our team, you know, may not have that domain specific knowledge. And adding to that customers picking up a graph neural network may not have that domain specific knowledge either. So what we've been working on, and, and, and this is public, I can talk about it, um, is a uh, framework in order to uh, essentially sit on top of both of the common uh, graph frameworks and uh, make them sort of like PyTorch Lightning, where you're more defining the workflow itself than the nitty gritty of like, oh, how am how am I going to, uh, you know, shard my data, or how am I going to represent my data and make sure that it doesn't get copied, like minimizing co like minimizing copies or or uh, other optimizations like that. We want to abstract that away from the user and make it so that you can define a graph workflow in in 15 lines of code. Um, because currently, right, like there's a lot of stuff that you have to do to get a graph to work. Like you have to like define like what the set of IDs in the test set is and the train set. And you have to, um, you have to make sure that the graph is not copied more than once, because if it's copied more than once, you're like graphs are huge computational structures that have to be stored in memory. Right? So if you have multiple copies of the graph, you're basically like losing out on the ability to have like a large graph because you've halved the size that's available. Um, so like minimizing copies and using advanced features from NVIDIA, like universal virtual addressing, where the, the GPUs have, uh, you know, uh, have the same memory addressing space as, as the CPU or as, as the, the system memory, um, stuff like that drastically improves the experience for users on, of graph neural networks and doesn't require them to have the systems knowledge or the arcane knowledge of, of PyTorch Geometric or DGL in order to scale their problems or in, in order to like take their, take the models they're working with to the scale that they want to use. Cool. So I want to ask a few questions now on your career in general, before we end the episode. Yeah. The first one is actually, yeah, probably a funny one. Let's say that you're at a table and you can choose anyone in the AI space to sit next to you and enjoy the meal with you. Who would you choose and what would you talk about? Um, that's a good question. Um, give me two seconds to think. Um, so there's, um, there's a scientist at DeepMind um, so I, I should clarify, like in, in, in the space of graph neural networks, um, there are quite a few, like really, really prominent people. Uh, so there's like Yuri Leskovec, who was at Stanford and, uh, and he, uh, he, he's been responsible for a lot of core research. There's, um, uh, who else there's, you know, Matthias Fay, who is the, the creator of PyTorch Geometric. There are, um, you know, many people on the DGL team at, at Amazon that have worked on it. Um, 
and but there's there's one guy and and I, i've met a lot of the people in grass there's one guy i haven't met i i would love to get lunch with peter velikovic peter if you're watching this you know let's let's grab lunch <laughs> uh, he works at deep mind he's uh he in my opinion a lot of the work he's done at, within google at, at deep mind has been very affirming of graphical networks and domains that like other people aren't working on like he worked on using graphical networks to help the routing algorithm for google maps um uh and i think that generally his work has been very you know uh interesting in the sense that like he's working in a do domain of gnns that is like not it's very science-based and, and, and I've enjoyed that. And, and, you know, of course there are a billion other people that I'd like to uh, connect with, but, but Peter's work and um, you know, his, uh, his career are very interesting. He's, he's incredible. So we talked a lot about deep learning and for many people, I think this could be quite a scary field, you know, data science, AI is already like not easy to get into, but deep learning seems like another level. Mm -hmm. So what would be your advice for someone who wants to get into deep learning? How would you yeah, get into deep learning? And is it really as intimidating as it sounds? Um, no, it's, it's not intimidating at, at all. Um, or it shouldn't be. Um, the reason behind this is that, you know, like there are hundreds, thousands, maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of people that have gone to work on the frameworks that underlie deep learning and make it easy. So, uh, you know, the contributors to PyTorch, the contributors to TensorFlow, the contributors to all these optimization libraries, Optuna and, and, and all these things. And, and their goal, their sole goal is to make a framework that works for developers and um, therefore works for you. Um, so picking up and playing with, with deep learning is not hard. The second thing is, um, uh, while math is very important for, for deep learning, right? Like it's, it's essentially core to everything. Um, the math itself in papers is like, once you get the notation down is it's, it's all present in the paper. A lot of papers are just self-contained. It's like, here's the math behind what we're doing and you know, here's how it's applied. So if you, even if you're, you know, not very advanced in math, as long as you understand like calculus, derivatives, integrals, um, you know, differential equations, uh, if you're able to understand that, and those are self-teachable, by the way, like they're, they're, they're not inaccessible. Um, if you're able to self-learn that and just work on like work your way through a paper, the math's all there. It's not like there's some hidden element that's being, you, that, you know, there's, there's no hidden sauce that's being hidden from you. Like academic research on, on deep learning is very upfront with like, here's the math behind it. And sometimes here's the code behind it. Um, and, you know, what I'd recommend to just get into it is, you know, if you're interested in a, in a certain domain, like diffusion, for example, read the, read the seminal papers, read like, you know, uh, I don't know what, I actually don't know what the first diffusion paper was. Um, but read, read these papers, understand that, understand, first of all, take a read for, through, understand it conceptually. Like don't, don't try and understand the math. Um, that, that comes a little bit later. Uh, once you've read through conceptually and you understand it at a conceptual level, read through the math to understand how the math relates to the concepts that you're, you know, dealing with. Um, and, uh, you know, if you apply that iteratively in the, in the scientific way, like the slow and steady, you know, building off of common known good way, um, it all just becomes intuition, right? Like it's all mathematical and, and structural intuition. Yeah, I feel you just need a bit of time, go through it little by little, but like even standard deep learning, like neural nets, if you start with that, it's, it looks super complex because you've, you've got all those layers, but in the end, it's just chain rule, you know, and you keep applying the same thing all the time. And so if you understand the overall concept, you will get things quite, quite easily. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So let's finish the episode with just one advice. If you had one advice for someone to progress in their career, what would it be? Um, be more confident. Um, I think that a lot of people are, are underconfident for 
no good reason. Like they see themselves as like ants among giants, right? It's like, Oh wow. Like all these people around me are so talented and like, I'll never reach them and, and whatnot. No, I mean, those people started from somewhere too, first of all, second of all, the other proportion of confidence is being confident. So there's confidence to start, right. Which is, is, is a lot. And then there's confidence to just be active and social about your academic interests, right? Like a lot of how I've gotten into deep learning and have enjoyed it has to do with the fact that I have gone out and, and met people in the deep learning space who maybe initially didn't seem accessible to me, right? Like these people, like, I'm like, oh, wow, you're like, you know, on, on the, you know, you know, on the backs, you're, you're a giant and I'm like a tiny ant. Why would you talk to me? Um, but then I realized it's just like, they're people too. And, and showing an academic and like intellectual uh, vivacity and, and, and I, I like to say like ravenousness, right? Like you're just consuming is, you know, like people love to help that. They love to talk about what they're working on and then they love to share and they love to help. Uh, for the most part, there are some people that don't, uh, don't push them too hard. But, uh, you know, for the most part, if you reach out to someone and say, Hey, I love your work, do you know, like, do you want to get a coffee or talk and, and, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's chat about it. Um, you know, the worst they do is say no. And it's not really like, they're not offended by you asking, right. It's, it's just like, Hey, you know, like, can I treat you to coffee? Sure. Let's, let's do it. Um, and that, that, you know, generally is my, my big piece of advice. Don't be, don't be afraid. Like you are, you are a cool person, I'm sure. Um, and you know, if you show that you're interested in something, people will want to talk about their work to you. Yeah. I think that's a super good point. Like two things based on this. The first one is, yeah, you often kind of underestimate yourself and you would think, oh, I'm, I'm doing mistakes and things like that. And you will see this super great and famous person that's and you will think oh they're for sure they're never doing any mistakes they've got everything figured out and um, no they're also humans and they are like you and they would make mistakes uh, no one is perfect and with social media and things like that it's sometimes difficult to realize that but yeah you're a human being like them and if they've done it you can do it as well yeah i actually you know there's there's one other piece of advice I've, I've i've given before that sort of corresponds to this right like deep learning i feel like is a very as i mentioned it's very trial and error and oftentimes your experiments will have failures like your the hypothesis will be proven false so what i recommend is to keep a failure journal i keep a failure journal and you know, for a given project, and I will record all my failures in it. Uh, it's self for, for two reasons. The first reason is, is obvious. If I see that failure again, I can just go go back and reference that failure journal. That's super easy. Second reason is that it provides me for context in the future. You know, the problems that I've overcome in the past, and and the the approach, the amount of approaches I tried, as a reminder that you know, like like being like persevering and, and staying, sticking with a problem generally leads to good results. Like, you know, experiment one, experiment two, experiment three, experiment four, like experiment five, like 20 experiments in, you're like, oh, experiment 21. I, you know, I found the solution to my problem. I found where the bug was in the code. And you can sort of sit on, sit on that mountain of failure and, and realize that your success came off of the back of those failures, um, which is useful for realizing that like, human beings natural state is failure and if you keep engaging that state if you learn eventually you'll reach success yeah no definitely agree and you actually get to learn a lot from mistakes much more than when you when you succeed at something or when you know you find a solution and you don't fail yeah you learn from it but you learn so much more when you make mistakes mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. I think that's a great point. Actually, I should probably keep one journal as well. Well, Kyle, thanks a lot. It was really great to have you here on the show. Have a great day in the US and yeah, hope to keep in touch and see you soon. Sounds good. See you soon.